Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention, please. You're all very welcome to this evening's program. My name is Neve King. I'm the Vice President for Programs here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And we're thrilled to welcome Professor Neil Ferguson back. It's his sixth time in the last eight years, so we're very grateful that he makes a stop here in the Midwest um, when he has a new book out. His new book, Kissinger, 1923 to 1968, The Idealist, will be for sale in the back, and he'll be signing them after the program. We're looking forward to what happens after 1968. We'll sign you up for that program soon. Um, I'm sure there's another volume. Um, tonight's program is on the record, so you may use social media, but please silence your phone so it doesn't interrupt the proceedings. We will be live streaming. A few upcoming programs. On Friday, we will be hosting David Axelrod, Alex Castellanos, uh, Evo Dalder, and Dina Schmelz, our colleagues, on the public opinion survey that we just released. In fact, Evo's just back from Japan where they released it in Asia, and the road to 2016. It'll be a great program at lunch. You can check it out on the website. October 26th, we'll be covering a program called The Red Web about Russia, cyberspace, and internet freedom. You may have seen about it in the press with Andrei Soldatov and Irina Borogan. And then on November 12th, we will be hosting chess grandmaster Gary Kasparov on a different topic than chess on Winter is Coming, Putin's Russia. It should be great. As many of you know, council programs are membership supported. Thank you very much for your support already. Membership starts at $100. It gives you access to 100 public programs a year. And we rely on your support. If you're not a member, I'd encourage you to join tonight because you'll get a complimentary copy of Professor Ferguson's book if you join. So check out our website or talk to me or my colleagues. I'll be back up for Q&A, but please could you join me in giving a hearty welcome to the stage to Mr. Tom O'Toole, Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer at Council Corporate Sponsor United Airlines. Thank you. Thank you, Neve, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure and a privilege to welcome Professor Neil Ferguson back to the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. As many of you know, Professor Ferguson has spoken with us on multiple occasions on topics ranging from the decline of Western civilization to the global financial crisis. This evening, Professor Ferguson is here to chat with us about the subject of his latest book, Henry Kissinger. This book is volume one in a two-part biography of this historically important figure, Henry Kissinger. Virtually every aspect of Kissinger's life has been dissected by journalists, historians, and polemicists, and yet with the, I think it's not hyperbolic to say, unique and unprecedented access to a trove of documents provided to Professor Ferguson. He'll share an insight encapsulated in the title of his book, Choosing the Idealist, as the title to volume one, a title that no doubt will surprise many who view Kissinger more cynically as a Machiavellian architect of international affairs. In researching this official biography, Professor Ferguson not only worked personally with Henry Kissinger, but was given full access for the first time to the vast Kissinger archives. So in conclusion, we are very fortunate to have Professor Ferguson here with us this evening. Many of you are familiar with his previous work and biography, but by way of brief introduction, and he asked me about my comments, I said they would be succinct, and so we will stick to that. He is currently the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of History at Harvard University. He recently announced that he will be moving to Stanford, where he will take the post of Senior Fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution. He is the author of 14 books, including Colossus, The Rise and Fall of the American Empire, War of the Worlds, and The Ascent of Money. So please join me in thanking and welcoming Professor Neil Ferguson. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It's wonderful to be back in Chicago. I can't tell you what a thrill I always get uh, when I come here, and I always get the best questions from this audience, uh, so I'm expecting much. <laughs> the first question that, that springs to mind is one I've often be, uh, been asked. Why on earth are you writing a biography of Henry Kissinger? And the second question is, and why on earth have you called volume one the idealist? I could see at least some people 
thinking that it was like agreeing to write the biography of Darth Vader. <laughs> I suppose the first volume would be called Anakin. I want to tell you how it came about. I describe this in the preface of the book, uh, but it's, I think, worth making clear to an audience like this. I was asked to write this book by Henry Kissinger. And it came about in the following way. We met in 2003 at a cocktail party in London. And he did that thing that you should always do if you want to make a professor well disposed to you. He said, I've read one of your books. <laughs> and we talked about that book, a book about the First World War that I wrote many years ago. And I was becoming enthused by the, the elder statesman, statesman's obvious familiarity with the book when suddenly he disappeared and reappeared on the other side of the room, standing next to the supermodel, Elle McPherson. <laughs> I had never seen this done before. <laughs> I thought, I can learn from this man. <laughs> Over a period of months, we corresponded, and the idea uh, came up that I might write uh, a scholarly biography. I know I was not the first person he approached. I think I may even have been the third. And initially, I, I said no. And let me tell you why. I said no partly because I knew it would be a colossal amount of work, that there would be a vast pile of documents. After all, few administrations have been better documented than the Nixon administration, <laughs> for reasons that I hardly need to dwell on. Every phone call taped and transcribed. But then I also thought of the reviews. And in particular, remember, this was the 2003 or thereabouts. I thought of Christopher Hitchens's review. And I thought, what a prospect. <laughs> so I wrote apologetically saying, I, on reflection, really felt I couldn't take it on. And in response, I got a letter, which was my introduction to Kissingerian diplomacy. I'm going to quote from a few letters this evening uh, because I think they give a good flavor of the book. I'm not going to do the voice. <laughs> what a pity. I received your letter just as I was hunting for your telephone number to tell you of the discovery of files I thought had been lost. 145 boxes which had, been, <laughs> which had been placed in a repository in Connecticut by a groundkeeper who has since died. These contain all my files, writings, letters, sporadic diaries, at least to 1955, together with some 20 boxes of private correspondence from my government service. Be that as it may, our conversations had given me the confidence, after admittedly some hesitation, that you would have done a definitive, if not necessarily positive, evaluation. I don't know if any of you go in for fishing, but if you um, imagine the fly landing on the surface of the river and the trout spying it, swimming up and biting, that was me. <laughs> Within a few weeks, I was reading through these documents I felt I couldn't pass up the opportunity, at least to take a look. And as soon as I began to read through them, really within a matter of hours, I realized I, I had to do it. The material was just too gripping, too surprising. Let me give you another illustration of, of what I found. I'm, I'm going to quote from a letter, almost the first letter that I read, from July 1948. Henry Kissinger writing to his parents, there is not only right or wrong, but many shades in between. The real tragedies in life are not in choices between right and wrong, because only the most callous of persons choose what they know to be wrong. 
real dilemmas are difficulties of the soul provoking agonies. I remember thinking, what's he talking about? Why would you write that way to your parents? I was hooked. I made, I made an agreement with Henry Kissinger, which it's important to understand, because some people think that an authorized biography is a whitewash, uh, a hagiography. Uh, but that's not uh, the case here. I said, I'll do this, but you have to understand that I have a completely free hand. You'll give me access to this material, but I'll also look for other material. And in the end, uh, there's material from 50 archives in this book, and I'll write it. And what I write, you will not be able to change, no matter how much you dislike it. So we agreed uh, to proceed on that basis. Incidentally, some of you may know a book that I wrote years ago about the Rothschild family. And, and I reached exactly the same understanding with them using the very same language, in fact. I said, I will strive to write this history, wie es eigentlich gewesen, Ranker's great phrase, as it actually was, or as it essentially was. The only caveat in this case was his request that any quotations from family correspondence of a personal nature, he should have some right to review. And I agreed to that. And it turned out to affect, I think, three sentences in the entire book. And they all related uh, to his first marriage. I went through a divorce in the course of writing this book. I don't think it was because of the book. <laughs> so I was sympathetic to that request. So on that basis, I set to work. And over the last 10 years, I have plowed through roughly speaking, 8,000 documents, 37,000 pages, material, as I mentioned, from 50 archives. And I want to give you a flavor of this material because I think it's really the key to the importance of the book. Then I want to tell you why the material inspired me to give volume one the subtitle, The Idealist, by the way, before anyone asks, I don't know what the subtitle of Volume 2 will be. I have not written Volume 2. I've done much but not all of the research and scarcely any of the really difficult thinking that one does once the research is complete. Imagine yourself as a refugee. Refugees are much in the news these days. Refugees pouring into Germany. But in 1938, the refugees were pouring out of Germany and coming wherever they could. The lucky ones came to the United States of America. The Kissingers, Henry Kissinger's parents, he and his brother Walter, uh, came in the summer of 1938 to New York City. Just six years later, in 1944, Kissinger found himself back in Germany in a U.S. Army uniform. And I want to quote from a letter that he wrote to his parents in November 1944. It is very late, and I haven't much time, but I must write a letter just so that I can affix to it the legend somewhere in Germany. So I have made it. Out in the darkness that envelops this town, rows and rows of shattered buildings line the roads. People wander through the ruins. War has come to Germany. So I am back where I wanted to be. I think of the cruelty and barbarism those people out there in the ruins showed when they were on top. And then I feel proud and happy to be able to enter here as a free American soldier. Notice, this letter was written in English. Not long after that, Kissinger found himself caught up in one of the nastiest battles of World War II, the Battle of the Bulge, as the Germans sought to make one last desperate offensive 
to the West. His description of the experience uh, of the front line is in itself gripping. But new shocks lay just ahead. As German military resistance crumbled and the American armies resumed their push into Germany, Kissinger and his fellow rail splitters uh, found themselves liberating a concentration camp. It was a small camp just outside Hanover called Arlem. And one of the documents that convinced me to write this book was a short two-page essay that Kissinger wrote shortly after that experience, shortly after witnessing the liberation of the camp at Arlem. It's a remarkable document because it's addressed to one of the inmates, a Polish uh, Jew. And I'm going to quote from that letter. Folek Sama, your foot has been crushed so that you can't run away. Your face is 40, your body is ageless, yet all your birth certificate reads is 16. And I stand there with my clean clothes and make a speech to you and your comrades. Folek Sama, humanity stands accused in you. I, Joe Smith, human dignity, everybody has failed you. You should be preserved in cement up here on the hillside for future generations to look upon and take stock. Human dignity, objective values have stopped at this barbed wire. What differentiates you and your comrades from animals? Why do we in the 20th century countenance you? Yet, Fulak, you are still human. You stand before me and tears run down your cheek. Hysterical sobbing follows. Go ahead and cry, Fulak Sama, because your tears testify to your humanity, because they will be absorbed in this cursed soil, dedicating it. As long as conscience exists as a conception in this world, you will personify it. Nothing done for you will ever restore you. You are eternal in this respect. April the 10th, 1945. Not long after that, Kissinger discovered that all his relatives who had remained in Germany, at least a dozen more, if you count, distant members of the family, had been killed, including his grandmother. And yet he stayed. He stayed in Germany longer than he had to. At some point uh, in late 1944, he'd been transferred from being a rifleman in the infantry to being a counterintelligence agent. In effect, he became a Nazi hunter, hunting down the most egregious offenders in the regime and trying to root them out. Later, he became an instructor at a college t to train uh, other agents in this work. And I want to quote from maybe just one more letter that it seems to me is highly significant. It's his explanation to his parents of why he had decided to stay longer when he could easily have been demobilized and come home. Why, in fact, he stayed until the summer of 1947. You'll never understand it, and I would never explain it except in blood and misery and hope. Sometimes, when I look down our table and see the empty spaces of our good and capable men, the men that should be here to nail down what we fought for, I think of the night Hitler's death was announced. That night, Bob Taylor and I agreed that no matter what happened, no matter who weakened, we would stay to do in our little way what we could to make all previous sacrifices meaningful. We would stay just long enough to do that. As I was reading through material like this, I was realizing that my original working title for the first volume was quite wrong. The working title was American Machiavelli. There was no Machiavelli in anything I read. 
quite the opposite. Nor was the, the beginnings of the arch-realist of American foreign policy. And there was certainly not a trace of that caricature, Dr. Evil character that Christopher Hitchens writes about in the trial of, of Henry Kissinger, and that a generation uh, of critics of the Nixon administration have come to cherish. I want to tell you the three ways in which I think it's right to think of Kissinger as an idealist. The first has to do with his own experience in the 1930s and 1940s. Kissinger had no reason to be grateful to the appeasers, to the architects of the foreign policy of appeasement that had paved the way to World War II. In a revealing interview in 1957, he said that the appeasers of the 1930s had thought of themselves as tough realists. That was not intended as a compliment. In the great argument that has gone on for so many years about American foreign policy between realists and idealists, it strikes me that far more than has been realized, the young Kissinger, in the first half of his life, down indeed as far as 1968, took the idealist side in many of the key arguments. Secondly, Kissinger became an idealist in a philosophical sense. After the war, encouraged by his mentor, Fritz Kramer, an extraordinary man who was also a refugee from the Nazis, Kissinger decided to apply to the Ivy League colleges. Kramer said, you can't possibly go back to City College in New York. A man of your talent needs to go to one of the great universities. He applied to them all. Princeton, Yale, only Harvard accepted him. The rest turned him down because his application was late. Harvard bent the rules, a, a rare occasion when Harvard bent the rules. And Kissinger went to Harvard under the GI Bill, turned up in the office of Professor William Yandel Elliot. Elliot was a sort of bombastic southerner an Anglophile who fancied himself a political operator as well as a political philosopher. In came Kissinger with his strong accent. Kissinger at this time, one has to imagine, thin. I know this is not the way you imagine him, but there's some great photographs that show the young soldier uh, and the young soldier demobilized, turns up at Harvard with his pet dog, Smokey. Smokey is a key character in the book. I'm happy to ask, uh, answer questions about Smokey the dog uh, and how he came to, to study at Harvard with Henry Kissinger. But in this moment, you have to picture the young, thin Kissinger arriving in Eliot's study and saying, I'm your new 2T. I've been assigned to you. Elliot's a busy man. He's probably planning yet another trip to Washington uh, where he hoped to be a mover and a shaker. So in order to get rid of this annoyance, he did what many professors have done in their time. He said, come back when you've read the works of Immanuel Kant. <laughs> I don't know if there are any professors in the audience. There are a few, but I mean, this is a great way of ensuring that you... <laughs> never see a student again, <laughs> except in this case, because Eliot underestimated Kissinger. Kissinger went off and read the works of Immanuel Kant and proceeded to write the longest senior thesis in the history of Harvard University, so long that it created a rule still known as the Kissinger rule about the length of senior theses. <laughs> and the thesis had uh, a very unpretentious, rather narrowly academic title, The Meaning of History. <laughs> the Meaning of History is not the most readable thing Henry Kissinger ever wrote, and many people who've tried to read it, I think, have given up, because certainly they haven't accurately captured its content. 
The essay is a reflection on the philosophy of Kant and in particular its applicability to history. And at the heart of, of Kissinger's analysis of Kant is the argument that we are free at the point of decision Freedom is something that we experience when we choose. Even if there is some trajectory of history leading ultimately, as Kant said in a famous essay, to perpetual peace, to the individual, the, the moment of decision is a truly free moment. We're not just corks on some great sea of historical determinism. This matters because this idealism, which I think was central to Kissinger's early academic career, led to the third reason that I think he should be considered an idealist. And that was his take on the Cold War. Many people today, as at the time, wanted to think of the Cold War in economic terms, as a contest between two economic systems. Many people today still think that's what it was. But Kissinger says very clearly, we cannot wage this war, this struggle, as if it is simply a contest to see whose economy, whose economic system is more efficient. Even in the senior thesis, he concludes, we would and should reject totalitarianism, even if it turns out to be economically more efficient. Because freedom is a higher goal, a higher thing than mere gross domestic product growth rates. So in those three respects, I think Kissinger was, as a young academic, an idealist. And when it came to practical issues, he tended to take, as I've already mentioned, the idealist side. Let me give you a couple of examples, as I'm sure some of you are skeptical. Kissinger's first job was actually, in his first government job, was actually in the Kennedy administration. He was one of those Harvard professors rounded up by John F. Kennedy uh, in 1960 and shipped down en masse to staff his administration in Washington. Now, Kissinger was not a big player in the administration, and this was partly because he was outmaneuvered by his boss, McGeorge Bundy, uh, who, who knew a little bit more about Beltway machinations than the young Professor Kissinger, but it was also because he tended to take the wrong side in key disputes, first over Berlin and then over Cuba. What I show in the book is that, that Kissinger was shocked at the realism of John F. Kennedy, at what he saw as the grubby deals that Kennedy did, first to resolve the Berlin crisis, allowing the Soviet-backed regime to build a wall around West Berlin, and secondly, in Cuba, doing a missile swap quite secretly that allowed the Soviets to withdraw their missiles from Cuba if the United States withdrew its from Turkey. On both these occasions, Kissinger protested that it was a, a shabby deal that was being done, in particular over Germany, a country, of course, he knew well, he felt that the principle of self-determination was being violated and that ultimately American policy should sincerely aim at a reunited, free, democratic Germany. That, after all, had been his goal back in 1946-47. When Vietnam surfaced as an issue, a crisis, a problem that was to bedevil more than a generation in American political and public life. Kissinger's initial response was conventional. The South Vietnamese don't want communist rule, we should help them avoid it. But early on, as early as 1963, he began to have his doubts. He had his doubts over the coup against Diem, which Kennedy casually authorized, and his doubts intensified in 1965, when Kissinger went to Vietnam and spent time flying around some pretty hazardous combat zones. He didn't just sit in Saigon. Uh, he got out. Uh, he went to some of the most hotly contested areas 
near the DMZ. He spoke with CIA and other forces that were trying to hold villages under attack from the Viet Cong. In 1965, his diary makes clear Kissinger realized that the Vietnam War was going disastrously wrong and would have to be ended by diplomatic means. And from 1965 onwards, that became one of the preoccupations of his life. In 1967, he was involved in an ultimately unsuccessful attempt to get negotiations started with the North Vietnamese through Paris, through contacts that he, Kissinger, had uh, in the scientific community. As I tell this story, the reader is gradually presented with a puzzle. The puzzle is why on earth was this somewhat idealistic Harvard professor appointed national security advisor by Richard Nixon? Nixon, a man he had repeatedly and publicly criticized throughout the 1960s. A critical point in the story is that Kissinger identified himself from early on in his own political career with Nixon's rival, Nelson Rockefeller. Now, here you have to realize just how different the past was compared with our own time. You have to take yourself back to a time when a man who just happened to be a multimillionaire, who wasn't intellectually terribly profound, in fact, scarcely read a book, and who had an extremely checkered marital career, such a man, back in the 1960s, could seriously consider himself a candidate for the Republican nomination in a presidential election. <laughs> How times change. Nothing, <laughs> nothing like that could possibly happen today. Wait. Nelson Rockefeller was no, no Donald Trump. But Nixon and Rockefeller were rivals, and Kissinger was Rockefeller's man. Any notion of Kissinger, by the way, as a, somebody willing to do anything to climb the greasy pole of politics falls apart when you realize that he stuck with Nelson Rockefeller through three unsuccessful bids for the Republican nomination long after everybody else realized Rockefeller would never get that job. So the book ends with the great puzzle of 1968. Why on earth did Nixon choose Kissinger? I won't give the game away, because after all, I'm here to incentivize you to buy the book. <laughs> I'll tell you the funny explanation that one of that one of Kissinger's students uh, gave me. Guido Goldman was one of Kissinger's PhD students at Harvard. And when I interviewed him, Guido said, when I asked him the question, why did Nixon pick Kissinger? He said, Henry was the only thing of Nelson Rockefeller's that Richard Nixon could afford. which is a good line, but not by any means the whole truth. The book shows that it's not, as Christopher Hitchens and before that Seymour Hirsch claimed, because Kissinger betrayed secrets about the 1968 negotiations in Paris and in return for betraying these secrets got the job. That's all nonsense, as I try to show in a chapter that reconstructs the events of 1968. But it's very puzzling. It's not as if there was any real prehistory. I thought there would be. This is how historians work. I was sure I was going to find an early meeting between Nixon and Kissinger, maybe in the late 1950s. And I was getting warm, as I thought, because I realized that Eliot, remember the bombastic Southern professor who sends him off to read Kant, Eliot became an advisor to Nixon. In the late 50s, he got close to Nixon. I thought, this is it. Eliot's the key. I'm going to find an early meeting, and I will show why it was that Nixon and Kissinger gravitated towards one another. No, for two reasons. First, 
Eliot stabbed Kissinger in the back. Writing to Nixon that of all Harvard professors that he, Nixon, might consult, he should avoid Henry Kissinger, Eliot's protege. Eliot already suspected that Kissinger was going to outgrow him like a sorcerer's apprentice. Even if that had not been the case, Kissinger did everything he could to avoid meeting Nixon. At one point, Nixon directly writes to Kissinger saying, I would like to pick your brains about, I think it was an issue of naval uh, armament. In order to avoid taking the meeting, Kissinger essentially made up a trip to Japan. Now, if you want to avoid somebody really badly, you say that you're going to Japan, <laughs> and not just to, you know, San Francisco. In fact, they never met until the end of 1967. And they met at a cocktail party. And oddly enough, on this occasion, it was the socially awkward Richard Nixon who broke the ice. I mean, some of you can already guess what I'm going to say. Because Nixon said, ah, oh, Professor Kissinger, I've read one of your books. <laughs> he had. And I think, ultimately, it had been through reading Kissinger's books and articles that Nixon had come to see that he was one of the great and original strategic thinkers of his generation. And although he had been on the wrong side of a decade or more of Republican Party politics, he might well be the ideal national security advisor. There are, of course, wheels within wheels. Almost certainly, Nixon thought that having a Harvard professor as national security advisor uh, would make life easy, as he intended to dominate foreign policy. And what would be easier than a Harvard professor to shove around? When Eisenhower, near his deathbed, heard that Nixon had appointed a professor to this job, he was indignant. He can't get a professor to do something like that, I really must speak to Dick. It was an unlikely appointment. In volume two, I'll have the challenge of showing how this strange partnership evolved, how they together devised a strategy for dealing with the great challenges the United States faced in 1969. But for now, I've achieved the halfway mark. I have explained at least to my own satisfaction, how a refugee who became a soldier, who became a Nazi hunter, who became an idealist philosopher, who became a theorist of nuclear strategy, ended up being appointed national security advisor by Richard Nixon. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'll thank you very much indeed and invite you to ask questions. take the questions for you from the audience. Okay. My Irish boss will <laughs> take the questions, she says. Um, thanks very much, Neil. Um, so please raise your arm and wait for the mic and make sure that it's a question. Yeah, we have a question right here, please. Thank you. One sec for the mic, Randy, thanks. Hi. Uh, what did Kissinger, uh, what was his opinion of Doug MacArthur's actions at the end of his tenure in Korea by confronting China? It's interesting because it falls in a kind of lacuna in the documents. Uh, he, he doesn't comment on it uh, much, at least not explicitly. So we don't really have the young Kissinger opining uh, on how far MacArthur had overstepped his authority in seeking to challenge Truman's presidential leadership, and in particular in arguing for the use of atomic bombs uh, in the Korean War. What we do have are his comments somewhat later on about what Truman had got wrong in Korea. And so let me give you, you, you a, a sort of two-part answer. Part one, Kissinger felt that the Korean War had been mishandled. He went to Korea. He was a believer in going to sea for himself. And at that time, I think he was still a reserve officer. Uh, 
and he felt that the war had been bungled. But he did not feel that uh, MacArthur had been correct. And that was because at that point in time, Kissinger still subscribed to the view that any use of nuclear weapons would be likely to escalate in a disastrous way. So, moreover, Kissinger was always extremely wary of the military overreaching uh, their powers. And that's a consistent theme in some of his later writing, that, that not too much power should be delegated to the commander in the field. The president must remain commander-in-chief. But it's interesting because... At this point, you have to remember in his career, he's, he's graduating from Harvard with his, with his uh, bachelor's degree the very month that the Korean War breaks out. Uh, so he's still pretty young. And he only occasionally writes to his mentor, Elliot, about those contemporary political subjects. It's not until some years later, once he's done the PhD, that he starts regularly to comment on foreign policy issues. His PhD, after all, is about early 19th century European diplomatic history. Uh, he's immersed in the Congress of Vienna and only occasionally surfaces to swap anecdotes about contemporary politics with uh, uh, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. in Harvard Yard. So you're asking about a very early part of his career as a strategic thinker. Thanks. Next question, Ivo Dalder, the president of the Chicago Council in the front row. It's coming this way. Did your flat tire get fixed? It's, it's being fixed as we speak, so thank you. Glad to hear um, that. Which is why I missed part of your talk, so I don't know whether I'm really hoping that I'll be able to answer your question by saying while your car exactly. was being repaired. Exactly. And you really was in Tokyo. <laughs> I really was in Tokyo, too. Um, there was uh, the, the, the time when he was a young professor at Harvard was a very interesting time. It was a time when most Harvard professors wanted to go to Washington. And there was an interesting power play between three young European professors, all of whom we all know and are, uh, and, and, and are equally brilliant, Henry Kissinger, Zbigniew Brzezinski, and Stanley Hoffman, yeah. uh, who, by the way, just passed away yeah. a, few, uh, a, few months, a few weeks ago. There was a lot of power politics among those people. Yeah. And in some ways, there's been interpretations in previous um, biographies that the start of the fight for who gets to Washington mm -hmm. is really among those three, yeah. one of whom never makes it uh, and, and never wants to make it, but two of whom become national security advisors. How much is true from your reading of that period that that's when it really starts, the, the process of wanting to go to Washington? It's a great question, and you're absolutely right. Uh, Harvard at this time was an extraordinary place. Uh, you, you had a terrific concentration of intellectual firepower, and it was targeted on the problems of the Cold War. Uh, you, you mentioned three, but there are other names that one could obviously throw in. People like Tom Schelling were working on the game theoretical aspects of the nuclear arms race as an economist who'd come into, into the field of strategic studies and one could, could go on. Um, I, I don't take the view that Kissinger was ruthlessly uh, climbing a greasy pole. Uh, and I, I think that that is something that people have back projected into his early life. Uh, I love Walter Isaacs, and, and his book was a, was a great kind of first attempt to do the biography, but without access to the documents, he had to rely on interviews. And interviews after the fact will tend to color the young, the young man uh, with the, the, the hues of the older man. When you actually look at the things that, that were said and, and written and done in the 50s and 60s at Harvard, a rather different impression emerges, one of friendships rather than rivalries. Uh, I mean, Kissinger first has this uh, very close friendship with uh, Arthur Schlesinger, who's a bit older and was already a tenured faculty member in the history department. Uh, when Brzezinski shows up, you find the two of them appearing on panels or speaking in the evenings at events. It doesn't look at that point uh, li like a, a rivalry. Uh, Sam Huntington is part of the same scene 
Uh, they're all very much in the same position, freshly minted PhDs. And the real challenge is not getting a job in Washington. The real challenge is getting tenure. <laughs> Isn't it always? Uh, and, and in fact, in, in their different ways, they each struggle. Because the government department has these sort of giant figures, as the history department did at that time, who think none of these people are worthy of tenure. Only we were worthy of tenure. So, uh, I mean, in various ways, they, they, they struggle. Kissinger, I should probably not tell this story here, but it's in the book, so I might as well. Um, Kissinger is in the awful predicament, as he sees it, of not getting tenure at Harvard and being offered a post at Chicago. And for him, this is a disaster. <laughs> I can't quite work out from the correspondence why he was so reluctant to come here, but he was very reluctant to come here. Maybe because, maybe because he felt that was too removed from the corridors of power. This was the age of Boswash, the corridor that was co going to connect Boston to Washington via New York. And I think Kissinger and his contemporaries were fascinated by the life that someone like Eliot led, teaching one day and then down in Washington the next. I think they were all attracted to that, but I don't see, I don't see a kind of rat race. Uh, I think they are very focused on their academic careers, it turns out to be really easy to get a job in the Kennedy administration because almost the entire Harvard faculty is hired. Uh, so that wasn't much of a contest. The, the real fighting began when they got there. Uh, and what I think happens, and it's something I touch on in this volume, is that friendships that had been forged at this time around the seminar table in the Center for International Studies and elsewhere were shattered only after Kissinger went to work for Nixon. And I think it was that, that moment, e even a little after it, at first everybody celebrates his appointment and you get people like Hoffman, I think it's Stanley who says, oh, this is a good thing that we'll have one of us dealing with the awful Nixon, whom the entire, entirety of Cambridge loathed. But after a certain point, that stops and then many of his colleagues turn on him and turn on him pretty ferociously. There's the famous story of the, the deputation from Harvard that goes down to denounce Kissinger over Cambodia, led by Schelling, very publicly. Uh, and for Kissinger, this was a traumatic moment because he thought they were his friends. Uh, and over that issue, those friendships were shattered. Stanley Hoffman, I should say a few words about since you mentioned him and his recent death. Stanley was my neighbor for the last 12 years at the Center for European Studies. He's the next office to me. And, uh, and so it's, it's kind of hard to believe that he's gone and I won't see him when I next go back. Uh, but he and Kissinger were friends in the 1960s. They worked on things together. They write affectionate letters to one another. For that to turn into such animosity, for Stanley Hoffman to write the really venomous reviews that he wrote of Kissinger's memoirs, it tells you something about academic life that is a little surprising, but Kissinger, of course, summed it up. It's so toxic because the stakes are so low. <laughs> All right, let's take a question from the back. Yes, the gentleman with the pink shirt on, please. So uh, you mentioned earlier that Kissinger viewed the Cold War as having uh, moral dimensions. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, do you know if in these early years he accepted uh, Kennan's view of containment or did he have another idea of how to uh, deal with the Soviet Union? It's a great question. Uh, Kennan, of course, uh, was this sort of uh, somewhat older generation State Department rather than academic uh, figure and it's Kennan's analysis of, of, of Russia's and the Soviet Union's pathologies that are fundamental to containment. Uh, they had an impact on the young Kissinger. At times when he writes about the Soviet Union, he, he's really echoing uh, Kennan because Kissinger was not a, a Russia expert. Uh, it was Germany he knew really well. Uh, and in that sense, there's, there's a lot of sub Kennan stuff when Kissinger's writing about the Soviets in the 1950s. There's even a chapter in his best-selling book, Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, that sounds uncannily like 
like Kennan in its characterization uh, of Russia stroke the Soviet Union and its, its peculiar historical uh, pathologies. Of course, they diverged in the 1960s. If you've read John Gaddis's fantastic biography of Kennan, you realize that the arcs of their lives were very different. Kennan had this zenith of influence at the time of the long telegram and then the anonymous X article in Foreign Affairs. But really, from the moment he was displaced by Nietzsche and others, uh, it, it's a sort of diminuendo that just goes on and on and on interminably, uh, with Kennan becoming more and more embittered and disillusioned with what's being done uh, in Washington. And the arc of Kissinger's career is quite different. He's an outsider for a long time. Uh, he becomes a public intellectual in 1957 with nuclear weapons and, and foreign policy. But he only finally gets into a position of power halfway through a very long life, and then has these sort of eight incredibly intense years, uh, after which he remains remarkably influential, advising in some capacity or another almost every president uh, from Ford onwards until, until the present incumbent, who doesn't seem to pay much heed to, to his advice. So I think Kennan's an influence at the beginning. Uh, he's very important in, in one respect. Kissinger says in an excellent essay, history is to nations what character is to individuals. And, and that was kind of Kennan's take on the Soviet Union, that it had a kind of historically driven character. But when Kissinger really makes the leap into public policy, it's to think about something different, which is the, the fundamental problem of nuclear conflict. Could you have a limited nuclear war? Might that be the only way to contain the Soviet threat? Remember, Kennan was ultimately somewhat optimistic. Even in that famous foreign affairs essay, he predicted that the Soviet Union would would decline and fall. He said the seeds of its decay are already there. Uh, it lasted longer than Kennan expected, and it proved more dangerous, in fact, than he'd foreseen. By 1957, it's the year of Sputnik, and Americans start to think, wrongly as it turns out, but they believe that the Soviets are overtaking them in terms of nuclear missiles. Uh, and that's the moment that Kissinger really comes to prominence, arguing for this notion of limited nuclear war, somewhat Dr. Strangelove notion when you first hear it. Thanks. Okay, next question. Do we have any women with their arms up? No? Oh, goodness. All right, let's go back to men. <laughs> yes, right there, please, in the black jacket on the left. Hello. Um, what did uh, Dr. Kissinger think of your portrayal of him as an idealist? And also, when exactly are you moving to Stanford? Say that again. When exactly are you moving to Stanford? Oh. <laughs> um, so question one, what does uh, he think of my portrayal of him? And so question two, when am I moving to Stanford? Um, well, the second one's easy, because I'm finishing this academic year at Harvard, and then we'll move uh, to, uh, to Stanford for the next academic year. It's a little hard to answer the question, what does he think of the book? In a sense, you need to ask him. I know that he has had moments of deep unease about how revelatory it is about his young personality, his young uh, self. And I have to admit that I wouldn't really like to see some of the letters I wrote uh, when I was in my teens or in my 20s, uh, published uh, even in a scholarly biography, especially in a scholarly biography. So I think he felt and feels unease about some of the, uh, the, the revelations about his, most, uh, his innermost feelings as a young man. I, I didn't mention something that I should have earlier. The letters that I quoted from the time of the war to his parents and the post-war years, I only got at the very end. I knew they were there because I'd seen a couple, but he was reluctant to, to let me have those letters until I'd pretty much finished the book. This is a kind of, this is the, 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 the nearest thing to adventures that historians have. Um, you, you think you've finished and you know, you've got a manuscript that, that has a beginning, a middle and an end, and then your subject hands you a file mm. 
of incredible letters requiring that you rewrite the book. And you don't know at what point he's going to change his mind and take the file back. So you might just have an hour to read your way through them. I think that was the key issue uh, that I had ultimately, I had this ability to, to reveal these very personal things and particularly about the relationship between him and his parents and his religious, um, his loss of religious faith during the war. But you asked about his portrayal as an idealist, and I think I can say with some confidence that he uh, was won over by my account of his writings, and that in his view, this is the best account of his thought that there has been. Uh, I think that was the thing that actually won his trust, ultimately, after years of, frankly, weariness. And that was why, ultimately, those personal letters were forthcoming. Um, but I, 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 can't, I can't quite convey the full complexity of, of his, his relationship to the project. At one point, the idea was that he would never read it. Uh, and I was the one who said, I think you should read these chapters because there may be things that are just plain wrong that only you know. And so I, I took a chance in doing that, but it was a good decision because there were things that only he could know. I mean, my favorite example of, of this is actually something that his, his wife, Nancy, told me. I'd finished the book. I'd written an entire chapter about Henry Kissinger in Paris in 1967, trying to get a breakthrough with the North Vietnamese, trying to start meaningful negotiations with Hanoi to, to, to end the Vietnam War. And it had been... He'd really been led up the garden path because the North Vietnamese at this point had no intention at all of uh, earnestly negotiating a peace. They were planning the Tet Offensive. So he spent much of the summer of, of 1967 in Paris. And as I had written it, he was there being led a merry dance by the North Vietnamese. <clears throat> After I had finished, Nancy Kissinger made me sit down and said, and simply asked me the question, Neil, what do you think Henry was really doing in Paris? in 1967, um, and I realized I had no real idea. And she said, uh, I was in Paris in 1967, and she had been there doing research for her doctoral dissertation on interwar France. He didn't really mind being messed around by the North Vietnamese. It gave him a terrific pretext to be there with his girlfriend. And it turned out from that conversation that they'd actually been seeing one another since 1964. I mean, a relationship that didn't make it into the US press until the early 1970s, almost 10 years later. So I learned some important, um, a certain humility as a historian from this project. You, you think you can find out everything from documents. You, as a historian, you have the sense that truth is out there if I only go to 111 archives. But guess what? Some of it just isn't there. And then you need your subject to, to help you. Thanks. Okay, next question. Yeah, right up here, please, in the second row. Steve Teeley. In the front, please. Right here, in the second row. Thank you. Does, does your research allow you to infer what Kissinger might have thought, how he might, let's say, rank or rate the administrations from Truman yeah. through Johnson, I guess, the last before he yeah. became in, in government? Yes. And it's very explicit, because he, he wrote at the time... Uh, as young professors will, very critically, about uh, each president. Uh, he didn't write much, as I mentioned earlier, about Truman because he was doing his PhD, and there are just fragments, really. But, but by the time Eisenhower is president, uh, Kissinger is writing regularly, criticizing the administration for its uh, dealings with uh, the Soviets, uh, for its handling of this or that crisis. And I mean, in some ways, he's the sort of typical insufferable Harvard professor who, who sits there uh, oblivious to the realities of government, uh, criticizing from his, you know, from his armchair. Uh, as he gets closer under Kennedy to the realities of power, uh, the criticism becomes more uh, nuanced. Uh, he begins to see that, in fact, uh, Kennedy had done a pretty good job of dealing with those crises, even if at the time Kissinger had felt he was soft-peddling. It's Johnson that is the real education, though. 
uh, because he sees Johnson up close uh, during the 1967 uh, non-negotiations. And, and he's shocked by what he sees. And I try to describe Kissinger's growing realization that there's something terribly broken with the way the Johnson administration makes foreign policy. This is an important part of the story, actually, of why he comes to be Nixon's pick for national security advisor. In 1967-68, Kissinger's one of a group of academics who start writing about reforming the decision-making process. There had been some of a, something of a back history of this, going all the way back to Eliot. But the, the, the recurrent themes were the State Department is a bureaucracy that tends to, uh, to, to tie presidents in knots or present them with bogus options. Uh, but the president needs to be enabled to make decisions by an effective National Security Council. And so what, what Kissinger is involved in in 68 is writing a whole series of reports explaining how it can be done better than it had been done under Johnson. Johnson had taken Kennedy's sort of freewheeling system and turned it into these rambling Tuesday lunches, which were really bad decision-making bodies. I mean, you read the transcripts of the meetings, they're awful, um, and they reveal a kind of fundamental uh, problem, which, which was really the problem of why Vietnam escalated. Johnson was not a good strategist. He thought of everything as domestic politics. That was his training ground. But when it was applied to foreign policy, it was a mess. What's fascinating, and I think this is really new in the book, is that these documents explaining how the president could improve on Johnson, the Nix president, were all sent to Richard Nixon. They were addressed to Nixon. And Nixon effectively had as it were, off the shelf from Harvard, a how to do it to remodel the National Security Council, to have a powerful national security advisor, and to marginalize the State Department. This had all been figured out, and he essentially enacted it. Okay, next question, please. Let's take one from the back. Oh, there's a woman, a blonde woman in the back there, please. <clears throat> then the last row, right there. You mentioned um, Kissinger's PhD on the Congress of Vienna. Yeah. And it's often been offered to students and interpreted as a work of realism. So I'm trying to figure out how you square that with your view that Kissinger was an idealist. Have you read it? Have you read it? A very long time ago. Right. So it, it was published. This is the book about the Congress of Vienna. And uh, it sort of the, it covers the period from Napoleon's downfall really to the, the mid-1820s. It's, I think, the most brilliant thing Kissinger ever wrote. It's an amazing book to read, uh, full of paradox, wildly overwritten in places. Uh, and, and, and although it's nominally a work of history, it's so full of aphorisms about the nature of power that it's, it's certainly no history book. And all the sniffy British historians who reviewed it uh, turned up their noses, but it's a terrific piece of work. What does it say? Well, it, it, it's absolutely not to be read as a kind of realist uh, manifesto. On the contrary, what the book does is A, to be very critical of Metternich, B, to regard Castlereagh as the British Foreign Secretary as the tragic hero, and C, to say something so important about the balance of power that even if your attention is beginning to wander towards the baseball, uh, which it may be, <laughs> you should just hang on for one moment more and lis listen to this. Because what he says about the balance of power in, in A World Restored is, is, I think, universally true. He does not have a kind of automatic system that is self-equilibrating in mind. It's not that the balance of power just kind of happens. Kissinger says there are three cr crucial things. One, there has to be a balancing power. Somebody has to, to make the balance happen. That, that was the role he really saw Castlereagh trying to get Britain to play, but ultimately failing. Secondly, and here's, this really goes to the heart of the matter, um, Here's the key point. This balance, this equilibrium, this order has to have legitimacy. 
And the process whereby it acquires legitimacy seems to me to re really take us much more into the realm of the ideal and away from narrow national interests. Uh, it, it's the legitimacy of the system that's its, its key. And thirdly, you have to prevent a revolutionary power from coming along and challenging that legitimacy and saying this whole order stinks. So that is a kind of simplification of the argument. Um, the reason it's not to be understood as, as a, a work of realism is also to be found in its unfinished sequel. Because Kissinger intended to write a trilogy the, the book about Metternich Castle in the Congress of Vienna was part one of three. Part two was going to be Bismarck and the unification of Germany. The unfinished manuscript is in his papers, and I found it. This was exciting. Again, historians don't have that many thrills in their lives, but <laughs> finding an unpublished book about Bismarck by Henry Kissinger was exciting. Uh, and there you see even more clearly Bismarck is not his hero. He is criticizing Bismarck very clearly for being too cynical. He says the problem about Bismarck is he's completely amoral. He'll do anything to advance the interests of the Prussian state. Anything. But that's not sustainable. Because ultimately, people need more than that cynicism. Legitimacy cannot come from that kind of, that kind of realpolitik. So I think I show in this book, mainly on the basis of Kissinger's own writings, that, that he's a critic of realism. And if you still don't believe me, and you have that skeptical look on your face, <laughs> remember who it is that he, he butts heads with uh, in the 1960s. It's, it's Morgenthau, Hans Morgenthau, who is the realist. And Morgenthau says, you, you were one of the ones who was in favor of Vietnam, and they have this great rather ugly dust-up about it. Uh, from the vantage point of Morgenthau, you, you could never have been interested in South Vietnam because it was in no way in the national interest of the United States to care what happened to the former French colonies in Indochina. And Kissinger had had a moment when he thought that it really did matter, but did matter for almost Wilsonian reasons to do with self-determination. Okay, time for one last question. Yes, um, a gentleman right here, please. By the way, your questions have lived up to my high expectations. I don't say that to flatter you. This is just, it's a great mental workout to come here. It's why I always come, because you really get asked stuff that, frankly, the New Yorkers just. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in, in New York tomorrow. I'll, get, I'll, I'll, I'll be in big trouble for saying that. Just it's challenging them. Come on. Raise your game, New York. Yes, sir. In, in looking through all the Kissinger papers, were there any other issues that he uh, was intellectually curious about? Um, this was the time of the rise of feminism, civil rights movement, uh, or was it all foreign policy uh, all the time? Great question. And I, I try to address this in the context of the Rockefeller relationship. One of the things that he did, as well as advising Rockefeller on his various <coughs> campaigns, uh, for a nomination, was to uh, organize the Rockefeller Special Studies Project, which was one of the ways that Rockefeller tried to kind of keep himself in uh, a position of influence, uh, it, it, as it were, on TV and in the newspapers. So these special studies were produced by a massive of academic uh, and, and, uh, and public intellectual figures. And Kissinger played a major editorial role. That meant that as the uh, overseer of this whole enterprise, he did have to concern himself with economic policy and, and social policy. But when you read through those reports, it's very striking what's missing. Because there's relatively little on civil rights. You, and you wouldn't know much about what was happening in the women's movement. Uh, from reading those documents. And my sense is that not only Kissinger, but a generation of academics uh, working then were kind of oblivious to the social uh, revolution that was happening uh, all around them. Uh, in the book, I have, a, I have a rather nice photograph of 
of Martin Luther King Jr. coming to preach at Harvard uh, in the early 1960s. And I put it in there because it's just not there in the text. It's not there in, in what Kissinger is, is focused on. Uh, and, and nor is, is the women's movement. Now, this matters because I think it helps explain why when student protest came to Harvard in the late 60s, and uh, it really exploded in 68, 69, and into the early 70s, it came as such a shock, not only to Kissinger, but to his contemporaries. I mean, they just hadn't been paying attention to this, this stuff. Uh, and I think you begin to understand, and this may be a good you know, answer on which to conclude, you begin to understand why, within such a short space of time, he went from being a hero figure, the super K of the Time uh, and Newsweek covers, to being a hate figure. Uh, because for that generation, whether they had come of age through civil rights or through feminism or through radical leftist uh, politics, he became the personification of all that they wished to hate and all that they had come to hate. Uh, and I, I think this is one of the ways in which I have to set up volume two. The generation gap was a yawning gap. And in particular, those men who had fought in World War II and then gone into the academy or gone into government had the greatest difficulty understanding the generation that they found themselves teaching by 1968. Um, I'll illustrate this with just one final example, if I, if I may. It, it's not just that if you were in World War II, you have a different view of bombing. I mean, Henry Kissinger arrived in Germany in 1944, and what he saw was a country that had been defeated by bombing. And what he saw was a totalitarian regime that it was very good to have defeated by bombing. The, the men who went through that, I think, had a different threshold when it came to the, the application of lethal force from the baby boomers who were turning up in colleges in the late 60s. But more than that, they had a different sensibility. One of the things I try to explain in the book is, is the problem of Henry Kissinger's humor. Henry Kissinger has a very well-developed sense of humor and is responsible for some very funny lines. Um, you know, nobody's ever going to win the battle of the sexes. There's too much fraternizing with the enemy. <laughs> it's a good line. A lot of the things that Henry Kissinger is notorious for were, in fact, jokes. The most famous thing he ever said, power is the ultimate aphrodisiac, is a joke. It's a self-deprecating joke. He says it in the context of an interview to explain why on earth these movie star stars like Jill St. John want to go out to dinner with Henry Kissinger. Uh, who is not a matinee idol to look at. So that's a joke. But like so many of the jokes that he makes, uh, it can be turned into something that's almost sinister. Um, and the best example of this is the line, uh, the illegal we do immediately, the unconstitutional takes longer. This occurs in a, in a meeting uh, in the early 70s with some Turkish diplomats. It is obviously a joke. It's, it's intended as a joke, but it's been taken out of context so many times by Hitchens and, our, and others uh, that people have completely forgotten or chosen to ignore the fact that it's a joke. My point is that that kind of humor, which is a kind of self-deprecation through exaggeration, is the humor of Groucho Marx. It's the humor of a certain era. Uh, where, you know, when you're made Secretary of State and somebody asks, how should, uh, how should we address you from now on? And you say sardonically, oh, I don't stand on ceremony. You can call me Your Excellency. That's a Groucho Marx-type line. But to the generation of 1968, that stuff just wasn't funny. They didn't find the Marx Brothers funny. In fact, I don't think they found anything terribly funny. Uh, maybe the effects of marijuana dull the sense of humor. But ultimately, this generation gap is the key to understanding volume two and why it is that he goes so swiftly 
from, from, being, from being Anakin Skywalker to being Darth Vader. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Yeah, well. Thank you very much, Neil.